Hello. All right, I have to come clean before I start. This is going to be my time. Is I have all my notes on my slides, which you can't see. So I, on the plane, when I realised, I was using my daughter's exam crib cards to, to write down, and now I don't have my glasses because I need to look at that. So if I'm staring and I can't focus, you're going to have to bear with me because that's what it is. And I've also been up very early this morning, so I've been taking lots of notes of what people have said and thought, I really must remember to mention that as a, as a learning from what I was going to say, and I'm sure I'm going to forget. So apologies in advance if I, if I say, oh, hang on, this is what I meant to say at that time. That is part of the reason. So, as the chair has kindly introduced me, I am Kate Garth, I'm from Energy Renewables, and what he didn't mention probably was actually most of my experiences from the retail side. So I'm a relative newcomer, I think, to some of the people on offshore. So when I was asked to do a presentation, it was to say, what's our actual experience of having operated in these different markets? So I'm not advocating one or the other, it's just what we found and it's not also on the basis of were we successful, were we not successful, it's actually does it work and what are the pitfalls and what are the advantages. So without further ado, here we go. So just a, for those of you who don't know who Energy is, we are a well diversified, see I'm reading down here, three and a half gigawatts of renewables in Europe. We also have a focus outside of Europe in America and in Asia and also latterly in Australia. And I'm sure some of you do know that there will be some changes coming but for the time being, that's where we are. We have, we operate in 10 European countries, and this year we inaugurated our first onshore wind farm, Dramada Beg, over in County Kerry. That was earlier this year. So we are working also with the Dublin Bay team to develop an offshore site off the east coast of Ireland. So, so my remit was to talk about what's our experience of a centralised jurisdiction. So I thought, fantastic, we can talk about lots. We work, operate in all these European teams or European areas, and I thought it would be great. So our key market is obviously in Germany, so I thought I'll start with there, and I'll take you through the process. So I've called it D to C without, with a T, so it's decentralization to centralization with a transitional phase, which I think is pretty much what we're advocating on this, on the panel at the moment. So to start with, in Germany, they did have a purely decentralised approach, and it was, the, it was predicated on the need to just get the offshore industry up and running, to get the developments up then, to get the renewable energy generated. It was supposed to be a low-cost approach, which is, again, what we're saying, and it had a very standard staging gate approach, and as you can see, well, you, you might not be able to see, but if you look up on, it just shows the multitude of where there were projects seeking to develop, all the way out, some very offshore, very far offshore, and as I say, to make it a quick turnaround scheme to get the developments working, if you were far offshore, you were compensated more. So, you know, it was a fair cost allocation. There was no benefit economically if you were near shore in terms of the, the subsidy you were able to, to receive. And just uh, for context, the first commercial site of 60 megawatts, I'm told, was connected in 2010. So it has been a long, a long period. So then... Obviously, multiple projects were seeking to permit and going through the, through the approach. And I should also say, I'm only looking at the North Sea. Obviously, in Germany, the offshore sector does count in the Baltic Sea, but it's too much space it takes up. So I have pre predominantly focused on the North Sea, but there is the Baltic Sea developments, which are going ahead at the moment. So they, in 2012, it was clear that the the developer-led process where they would sort out the grid connections and, and permit all, all across, as we saw in that previous slide, it wasn't sustainable. So in 2012, they moved to what they call the systema systematic grid planning process. And it meant that the grid developments would be focused, particularly in the North Sea, in one to, in one to eight specific clusters. And all those other sites which had been seeking to permit and uh, were within the development time frame, they were all sort of stopped and it impacted about 40 projects. So the, the questions earlier on about what happens for the sunk DevEx costs, well, you know, this is one of the implications that comes out of that. So the, the question was, well, what do you do about that? Obviously, people were quite upset, and it sort of was further developed back in 2017 when there was a new offshore law was passed, the WINSEC, and this meant that they would move. This is when they decided that they would finally move from the decentralised model to the centralised model, and it would be central auctions. The auctions would enable you to have grid connection and 
you would also then get the whatever the subsidy was would be available so it was part of one big package and this obviously led to the problem well what do you do with those projects which are part way through the development process or, or have already got to the staging gate to the staging gate situation that we talk about so they decided just to, to minimize i suppose the development or developers uproar and also risk of challenges which has been discussed earlier in the day they had two two ways they looked at it or two two implications for it so to start with all the projects which were under development had passed through their staging gate were well on the way to being developed if they could reach completion before 2021 they were allowed to continue so the developer-led model would continue and then they also decided that would, they would go for the what we call the transitional tender phase so there was allocation of two auctions one in 2017 and one in 2018 both for excuse me <coughs> 1550 megawatts so in total 3.1 gigawatts was going to be up was, was going to be made available over those two auctions and they have to, the, the requirements were, if you were one of those project developers, you had your scheme, you had to, there, there was some very basic criteria, but in, in, just to keep it short, really, you had to complete, the development should complete before 2020 or by 2025, and it had to be, your development had to be within the clusters one to eight. So again, obviously, if you think back to that first slide where there was developments all over the shop, if you had your development in that, those particular zones, then you were, able, you were enabled to participate in those two auctions, those only two auctions which took place. And just to give you, so I suppose an example of all, how do you make sure you can you maintain the competitive pressure? So the whilst there was 3.1 gigawatts available, eight gigawatts were actually competing for that. So you had your competition just in terms of the volume, but also within the clusters, the different projects that so you were competing also to get access to the to the cables, to the transmission capacity, the converter stations there. So competition was absolutely forced on, even if you'd already got to that point of the development, you'd reached your first staging gate or, or you were already permitted. So this then led to a question, well, what happens after those tenders? And the the point I was thinking earlier on, and I, I apologise, I can't remember which speaker it was who said to me, what happens if people want to participate in an in a development which has already been looked at or does someone want to try and take it as part of the this law the the 2017 law when it was introduced they said okay for these for these sites which meet the criteria so delivery before 2026 in clusters one to eight the two tender auctions if you're not successful the arrangement and i'm, and I'm super sim simplifying here is if you passed on your details, so all your environmental impact assessments, all the investigati investigatory work which you had done, you are allowed to have a last call option if your site, the site that they use, comes up in the central auction. You can have the last call option, so you have an opportunity to bid in at the lowest tender at that price when the central auctions come around. So that is one way of looking at how, how you get over that question about, well, if you already put all your DevEx into it and you've invested a lot of money, well then how do you stop people, you know, judicial reviewing, complaining? This is just one approach that they took. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit now. So this then takes you to where we are now. So this, the centralised model was agreed back in 2017, and this is, I suppose, the point that Kieran is underlining. It takes quite a long time. So in 2019, so obviously two years after the law was implemented, they've published the site development plan. So these are the final ones. And this outlines the auction year, when the completion of the sites must be made, where it will connect, so within which particular clusters. And it, it's very difficult. If you're, you will get the slides and you can kind of zoom in and you'll see the different clusters, that they're clusters within the, the clusters, as it were. So it, it's, it's still that competition is, is engaged. And... Well, what does this mean? So we, we have this clear we have this clear plan of what's going to happen. But the problem is, well, the the rules which were set out say the the maximum bid offer for these auctions will be based on the lowest bid that was placed in the transitional auctions. So the 2018 auction, which just happened last year, and obviously the problem is that, that lowest price was zero. So well, what what do you do? The there's no mechanism for any other choice in terms of its lowest bid. 
So they are going to have to change the rules. Something will have to happen. I think industry in itself is calling for really taking a move to a two-way CFD because there's really no other way around it. How do you decide between bids of zero, particularly when the those developers who had the last call option would also they were they were the only people who will automatically win if they also accept a zero bid. And so there's a real problem about well, how do you get over that? And I suppose that the point to underline is this has been very well planned out. This has been under conception for, for many years by the time it actually get, get implements it just shows you best laid plans can go wrong and now there will be unintended consequences and I would suggest no matter how well you plan it that is going to happen so so I'm oof, not even half a way through here okay so so the Dutch approach is D to C without T so similar to the the German position I'm, and I will really have to get a bit past here as you can see on the left picture so this was in 2014. This is all the projects which had reached the final stage of permitting. They, it was a decentralised approach, and they realised, I think, I suppose, back in 20, after the 29, 2010 last round where it was developer ready, it was, just wasn't sustainable. They'd had 70 projects trying to get grid connections and going through the impact assessments, developing it. Of those, only three actually made it into the auctions. So clearly something had to happen, and they decided that they would go for this centralised approach. And I think the intention was, I think the developers who were involved expected to have some kind of hybrid, some kind of transitional phase, which they'd experienced in Germany, and it didn't happen. So there is a, a question, as you can see, of all the, the sites where people had got permitted developments going through. Most of them have come up for auction in the centralised scheme, which was then, it was agreed in 2013, and the first auctions took place in 2016. And... They're going through as, as we speak at the moment. They had the the twenty the, the roadmap plans, which would set out how you would achieve an additional three and a half gigawatts of capacity. So substantial increases were to, were put in place to deliver by 2023, and they've recently published their roadmap up to 2030, which is looking at increasing that up to about 11 gigawatts. So in terms of the just a nice diagram that they have on the tenant website. It just shows you how the what the TSO responsibility is. So the developer is responsible for collecting up the wind farm up to the J tubes, and then the, the TSO does the rest of it. And I think the key thing to focus on is there's there's a clear benefit, I suppose, particularly in the Holland situation, which was they didn't in some areas there was not sufficient onshore transmission, so they started at the other end of the country. So it takes into account how you plan it, the benefits that you can you can achieve. And I think it's fair to say the the work that was done in terms of making sure that the developers had the right information to be able to bid to bid in to make their developments coming through. It was developed in very close collaboration with industry, with government, with the regulator, and government basically went out to industry and said, what do you need in order to be able to get to FID within 18 months, 12 to 18 months? So the, the package of information they provide, there's a web link on to the, to the South one, which was out last year. All the information there, it's fantastic, so I'm not going to put any more information because there isn't really time. And this is just the sort of outline for the developments out to 202030. So you can see it's coordinated, it runs on a geographical basis, a colleague in the Dutch team was saying, you know, it's massive shipping, you know, in terms of where's a very busy place. Well, off, off Holland is one of them, so you do need to have that coordination going through. Okay, so it just, um, I'm not even going to talk about this one, but this is just another experience. So we bid into the Massachusetts auctions last year, and it's a very different approach, obviously. You bid for the seabed lease, but there's no guarantee. This is only the first step. It doesn't give you a grid connection. It doesn't give you a route to market. And there is a very long lead time. Sorry, the chair's just looking at me saying, hurry up. Um, there's a very, potentially very long lead time to get your site up and running for about 33, I think possibly even now to 37 years. So in terms of ensuring that the um, sites will be delivered, it's not entirely clear that will be the case. So I suppose in summary, and I think a lot of Kieran's already said, I was looking at, well, what, what are the benefits of a centralised approach and what did we find? So I won't go through those because those are fairly straightforward. The German experience shows that if there's going to be a clear timeline between going from a decentralised to a centralised option, having options, allowing developers to bid in, giving a phased approach, allowing two schemes to run at the same time and having sufficient time is critical. The Dutch, or, the Dutch approach, whilst everyone was hoping for a transition and they didn't get it, our experience 
and we weren't successful in the auctions that took place. Our experiences, the information they provided was fantastic. It was very well done. The deadlines were very tight, and I think that's another point that's being made. It will take time, and it is going to take time to enable it to come to fruition. So they'll have to start planning now. Um, I'm out of time, I'm getting flashed. So I was looking at, well, what does this mean for, for Irish offshore grid development? You know, I'm coming down on the, is it, should it be centralised, should it be decentralised? It's, it's not for us to say. And every country has its own unique challenges. Germany and Denmark, obviously very, not Germany, Denmark, Germany and Holland, obviously very different to Ireland. But I think the, the key thing to call out is really, you need to have that close collaboration in terms, if you move to that centralised scheme in terms of where the information is provided, the site areas are mapped out, they're doing the information, what, what does industry need to make sure that the government regulator and grid provides, the first one? There is going to be a need for a hybrid or a transition approach, simply if when you look at the time scales, which have already been alluded to several times, if we wait in the, the time it, take, it took for the Dutch and the German experience. It was many years between the rules being implemented, the law being passed, not even the getting the law in place, you know, passing it and then getting to the auction stage and the grid transmission, um, the, 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 the decentralised scheme will take some time. And we need to make sure that's met because those 2030 targets, as has been reiterated on a multiple, multiple times today, are critical. We need to have that. So you need to have strategic management of your network. And I think making sure that there is alignment between your onshore and your offshore network, particularly there was the experience from the Dutch, it worked really well because it was all aligned, it was all managed by the same parties, and therefore there wasn't, you know, no, there wasn't an issue of trying to commit to get an offshore connection without having the ability to transport it onshore. All those problems were avoided. So apologies, it's been a bit of a rush, and there was an awful lot more information I could give you, so any questions... Possibly not after this one, but feel free to email me and I'll do my best to get back to you. Okay, thank you.